So we're continuing on with this Damascus document. Uh, I can't remember exactly where we left off. I think we left off right here. Okay, so according to the covenant which Elohim made with the first to atone for their sins, so too would Elohim make atonement for them. And with the completion of the era of the number of these years, there will be no more joining to the house of Judah, but rather each man will stand on his own net. Um, and accord, according to this, I guess in the Habakkuk Pesher, the word there is watchtower, not net. Um, but then they go on to say the fence is built and the law far removed. And in all these years, Belial was sent against Israel, as Elohim foretold by the hand of the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amoz, saying, Panic a snare and net are upon you, O inhabitant of the land. Its interpretation concerns the three nets of Belial. So again, you see this Belial, which is the, the title or the, the name used by uh, the apostles and Yeshua in the New Testament. Speaking about the wicked one. The three nets of Belial, about which Levi, the son of Yaakov, spoke, by means of which he catches Israel, transforming these things before them into three kinds of righteousness. The first is fornication, the second is riches, and the third is pollution of the temple. He who escapes the first is caught in the second, and he who eludes the second is caught in the third. The builders of the wall uh, who followed so-and-so, he is the spouter about whom it said, he shall surely spout. So, the builders of the wall follow um, so-and-so, and so-and-so and -so is the spouter. So, again, you know, the spouter of lies, I believe, is Paul. Um, the builders of the wall are the ones that will daub plaster over the wall. Basically, they're just covering up, covering up the weaknesses in the wall. They're putting plaster over the, the breaks in the wall. Um, similar to what Yeshua talks about, the whitewashed sepulchers. I mean, you cover these sepulchers with whitewash, trying to you know put lipstick on a pig. In this case. The wall is cracked and the wall is falling down. They're putting you know, plaster on it to try and cover up the cracks instead of repairing the wall. So the builders of the wall follow so and so, the spout of lies. Um, and they are caught in two of these in fornication because they two, take two wives in their lifetime, whereas the foundation of creation is male and female who created them. Um, same thing Yeshua said. Like that's the, the same phrase, the same scripture that Yeshua used when speaking about uh, marriage. In the beginning, male and female, he created them. And regarding those entering the ark, two by two they went into the ark. And as for the ruler, the Nazi or the prince, it is written, he shall not multiply wives to himself. But David had not read the sealed book of the Torah, which was in the ark of the covenant, since it was not opened in Israel from the day of the deaths of Eleazar and Joshua and the elders who served Astarte, and they hid it. And it was not revealed until Zadok arose, and the works of David rose up, except for the blood of Uriah. So this is also similar to what Kepha says in the Nazarene Acts, that the law was lost and then it was discovered in the temple in the days of Solomon. Well, the, the priest in the days of Solomon was Zadok. Uh, when David was king, there was Zadok and Abathar, and then Abathar was dismissed by uh, Solomon, and it was only Zadok who was the high priest. So they're saying that David did not know not to take more than one wife, or not to multiply wives. In the Temple Scroll and Dead Sea Scrolls, it doesn't say the king may not. When, when Deuteronomy says you shall not multiply wives yourself, um, it appears that that's saying it's okay to have one or two or three wives, but you're not to have like you know, 50 wives or whatever. Um, and so David, you know, he had quite a few. According to the Temple Scroll, you can only have one wife. Even the king can only have one wife. And 
So they're saying that David did not know that he couldn't have more than one wife. I think is what is being said here. Okay, uh, except for the blood of Uriah, and Elohim counted them to him. Uh, so he's counting them being the works of David that rose up. Those were counted to him. Secondly, they, the builders of the wall, also pollute the temple because they do not separate as prescribed by Torah. So these you know, followers of the spatter of lies are not separating clean, the clean from the unclean, which again comes back to what Paul's doctrines are. But rather they lie with a woman during the blood of her period, and each man takes to wife the daughter of his brother and the daughter of his sister. This is a, a uh, trait of the Herodians. The, the Herods were notorious for this niece marriage. Read the book of Josephus, and it's, I mean, it's almost like that's the only women that the Herods married. Every one of these Herodian um, kings, they would marry the daughter of their brother. So, this is exactly the criticism that we see here in the Damascus document, and of course there is the connection of Paul with the Herodian family, so it appears that Paul was a Herodian. And again, you have the same, all of this just one way or another connects to Paul sometimes. But Moses said, You shall not approach your mother's sister, she is your mother's near kin. But while the law of incest was written for males, it likewise applies to females. Therefore, if the daughter of her brother uncovers the nakedness of the brother of her father, he is near kin. So they were saying basically that, well, since the Torah only says not to marry the daughter of your sister, it's okay to marry the daughter of your brother. They're, they were, again, it's one of those loopholes or breaks in the wall that this um, these people look for also they pollute their holy spirit and open their mouth with a tongue full of insults against the laws of the covenant of elohim saying they are not certain they speak an abomination concerning them all of them are kindlers of fire and lighters of firebrands so again you know, i hate to keep saying the same thing over and over again but again that, that comes back to paul's doctrine and comes back to what we see historically in the works of Josephus with regards to the Herodians. Their webs are spider's webs and the eggs of vipers are their eggs. Whoever approaches them cannot be cleansed. Like an accursed thing, his house is guilty unless he is forced. For in former times, Elohim visited their works and his wrath was kindled by their actions. It is a people without discernment. They are a nation devoid of counsel because there is no intelligence in them. But in former times, Moses stood up, again, standing, standing one doctrine. Moses stood up along with Aharon by the hand of the Prince of Lights, while Belial, in his guiltfulness, raised up Janus and his brother at the time of the first salvation of Israel. And in the era of desolation of the land, the removers of the bond, the removers of the bound, stood up and led Israel astray. And the land was decimated because they spoke rebellion against the commandments of Elohim as given by the hand of Moses. Again, you see this um, same doctrine that Moses gave her an original Torah, but um, spoke rebellion, so they, they, they changed the Torah. Um, so they're speaking against the commandments of Elohim as given by the hand of Moses and against his holy Messiah. Again, this is singular, not plural. Uh, they prophesied lying to turn Israel aside from Elohim, but Elohim remembered the covenant of the first, and raised up from Aharon men of discernment, and from Israel men of wisdom. And made them listen, and they dug the well, the well which the princess dug, which the noble, nobles of the people dug with the staff. The well is the Torah, and its diggers are the penitents of Israel who went out from the land of Judah to dwell in the land of Damascus. Same thing that happened with the early assembly. They went out from Judah, they left Jerusalem, and they went to dwell or to sojourn in Pella in the land of Damascus. 
for which reason Elohim called them all princes, because they sought him, and their honor was questioned by no man. And the staff, he is the interpreter of the Torah, of whom, Isaiah says, he creates an instrument for his works. And the nobles of the people are those who come to dig the well with the staves. Uh, there's some play on words here in the Hebrew. In which the staff decreed they should walk during all the era of the evil and without which they would not persevere until the standing up of he who pours down righteousness at the end of the days. So again, we see the standing one doctrine. Uh, there's his character, the, the teacher of righteousness now. I think Robert Eisman makes a pretty good case that the teacher of righteousness is James and that Yeshua is the righteous prince or um, Yeshua may actually be this one who pours down righteousness because at, um, as we get a little bit deeper into it, it no longer speaks about the teacher of righteousness but another person who's going to bring righteousness and we think that may be Yeshua. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, who pours down righteousness at the end of days, but all who have been brought into the covenant shall not enter the temple to kindle its altar in vain. Rather, they shall be the bearers of the door, barters of the door, as Elohim said, who among you will bar this door? Nor should you light my altar in vain. So, this is Acts 21.30. That's where in, in, you know, Paul goes into the temple and the zealots, the Nazarenes there, attempted to kill Paul. And they would have if he had not been rescued by the, by the Romans. But they ran him out of the temple and it says there in Acts that they barred the doors after him. So you see this connection with barring the doors with, again, Paul. If they do not keep the commandments to do according to the precise letter of the Torah and the air of wickedness to separate from the sons of the pit to keep away from um, polluted evil riches acquired either by vow or ban and to keep away from the riches of the temple and by robbing the poor of his people from making widows their score and spoil and murdering orphans. Okay, so Again, you see this connection to you know, these people that you are barring the door from uh, are the ones who do not keep the, the Torah. And if you look in the book 20 of Josephus Antiquities, he speaks about this Herodian named Solus and his brother Costobarus, who was stealing the tithes from the priests and he was stealing from the poor and he was basically an agent of Ananias, the high priest, who, you know, you could even relate that also to this making widows or score and murdering the orphans. Well, who is this solace that is a relative of the Herods? We, we should know who he is. Um, but rather to separate between polluted and pure, and to distinguish between the holy and profane, and to keep the day of the Sabbath according to its precise letter, and the festivals and the day of fasting according to the commandments of those entering the new covenant in the land of Damascus, to set up the holy things according to their precise specifications, to love each man his brother as himself, which of course is the royal law according to James 2.8, to strengthen the hand of the meek, the poor, and the convert, for each man to seek the welfare of his brother and not uncover the nakedness of his near kin, to keep away from fornication, according to statute, to reprove each man his brother according to the commandment, and to bear nor rancor from day to day, to separate um, from all pollutions according to their statute. Okay, so. There's a lot of these um, words that are being used for keeping away from or separating are related to this uh, Nazar, which is, of course, 
similar to or close to Nazareth, Nazareans, um, Nazarite is about separating. And um, Dr. Eisman thinks that this itself is also relating back to this understanding of them being Nazarenes, Nazareans, because they separate. And that that's why the the early believers in Yeshua were called by that. It's not because Yeshua was from Nazareth, but it's because he was known as a Nazarene or Nazarean because he was one of these Nazars who separated from um, the unclean. And no man should defile his Holy Spirit, which I let him separate for them. Rather, all should walk in these things in perfect holiness on the basis of the covenant of Elohim in which they were instructed, faithfully promising them that they would live for a thousand generations. Uh, we have a manuscript B which adds a little bit to it, but it doesn't really change the meaning of the text. And they take wives and beget sons, they shall walk in accordance with the Torah and according to the statutes. Uh, I skipped one over, I'm sorry. They should live for a thousand generations. And if they are living in camps, as per the rule of the land, that they take wives and beget sons. They shall walk in accordance with the Torah. And according to the statute, they were instructed in as a rule of the Torah, which speaks about between a man and his wife, and between a father and his son. But all those rejecting the commandments will be paid the reward of the evil ones when Elohim visits the earth. And then we got two different versions of the manuscript, so, so we'll read through both, both of them. When Elohim visits the earth, when there will come to pass the word which is written in the word of Isaiah, son of Amos, the prophet, which says, there shall come upon you and upon your people and upon the house of your father days like of which you have not come, or days like of which have not come since the day Ephraim departed from Judah, when the two houses of Israel separated. Ephraim departed from Judah, and all those who turned back were delivered up to the sword. But those who held flat help, who held fast, escaped to the land of the north, as Elohim said. I will exile the tabernacle of your king and the bases of your statues from my tent of Damascus. The books of the Torah, these are the tabernacle of the king. He, Elohim, said, I will establish the tabernacle of David, which is fallen. The king is the community, and the bases of the statues, they are the books of the prophets, whose words Israel despised. And the star is the interpreter of the law, who came to Damascus. As it is written, a star shall go forth from Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. The scepter is the prince of the whole congregation, and with his standing up, again, standing one doctrine, he shall utterly destroy all the sons of Seth. These escaped in the era of the first visitation, while the backsliders were given up to the sword. So that was the first manuscript. The second manuscript was... But the, all those rejecting the commandments will pay the rewards of the evil one when Elohim visits the earth. When there shall come to pass the word which is written by the hand of Zechariah the prophet, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man who is my companion, says Elohim, strike the shepherd and scatter the flock. Of course, that's associated with Yeshua also. And I will stretch my hand over the little ones. The keepers of him are the meek of the flock. These shall escape in the era of visitation, but the rest shall be given over to the sword with the coming of the Messiah of Aharon and Israel, as it was in the era of the first visitation. Concerning which, Elohim said, by the hand of Ezekiel, to put a mark on the foreheads of those who cry and weep, but the rest shall be given to the avenging sword of the covenant, while the backsliders were given up to the sword. So there's two different versions of, of this document. And this also will be the judgment on all those who entered his covenant who did not hold fast to these laws and statutes. Their visitation or command will be for destruction by the hand of Belial. This is the day which Elohim commands um, the prince 
The princes of Judah are those who are the movers of the battle, upon whom wrath shall be poured out. For they have become diseased without a cure, and he will exterminate them, since all of them are rebels, and have not turned aside from the way of the traitors. So again, if this way of the traitors is the way that Paul is teaching, um, this is you know, some pretty serious um, condemnation that they're throwing toward the more um, you know, Gentile church versus the Torah observant church that the apostles founded. Rather, they have immersed themselves in the ways of fornication and evil riches. So again, you see this, you know, there's the false immersion, and then there's the immersion that the um, authors of this document were participating in. <clears throat> they have been vengeful, and a man has borne malice against his brother, each man hating his brother. And each man has sinned against the flesh of his own flesh, approaching them for fornication. So, again, this, you know, incest charge is something that you could definitely apply to the Herodians. And they have used their power for riches and profiteer. So who would who would have this power? Well, the Herodians were the most powerful individuals there in Judea aside from the, the Romans. And of course the Herods were agents of Rome, so it's all the same, the same group of people. Each man doing what's right in his own eyes, and he's choosing the, for the stubbornness of his heart. For they did not keep apart from the people, and have knowingly sinned, walking in the ways of the evil ones, about whom Elohim said, Their wine is the venom of vipers and the cruel poison of asps. So these peoples would, of course, you would think, you know, Gentiles, did not keep apart from the people. The vipers are the kings of the peoples, and their wine is their ways. Now, the kings of the peoples, that is a, a title that the, the Romans actually applied to, like these puppet kings that they would set up. So the Romans would appoint the Herods to be the king of Judea, and then he had other groups that they would appoint to be the heads of Syria. The Romans would appoint someone to be the head of you know, all these Galatia or whatever. And so the Romans called their puppet kings the kings of the peoples. So this same kings of the peoples would be, um, it could all, it's another thing you can apply to the Herods. Their wine is their ways, and the poison of asps is the head of the kings of Greece, or the Grecian kings. Um, which again, there is some play on, on um, Greece being similar to Rome who comes to execute vengeance upon them. But all this, the builders of the wall and the daubers with plaster, have not understood because one of confused wind, or confused spirit, you know, Paul, in, in the book of Acts, it talks about Paul having a different Holy Spirit than the one that the believers uh, from Judea had. And that's why they ran into this guy Apollos, and, um, you know, Paul's followers had to teach Apollos about Paul's Holy Spirit, because Apollos had a different type of Holy Spirit. So, one of confused Ruach, um, walking, okay, yeah, there's a long note here, so I'm going to skip the note. One of confused Ruach and the spouter of lying spouted to them, which kindled Elohim's wrath on all his congregation. So again, you see this confused ruach associated with the spouter of lies. Nor do they understand what Moses said, not for your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart are you going to possess these nations, but because of his love for your fathers and keeping the oath. And this is the judgment upon the penitents of Israel who turned aside from the way of the peoples because and this is the judgment upon the penitents of Israel who turned aside from the way of the people because Elohim loved the first who testified on his behalf. 
They love those coming after them because theirs is the covenant of the fathers. And because of his hatred for the builders of the wall, his anger was kindled, and this is the kind of judgment that will be upon those who reject the commandments of Elohim and forsake them, turning away in the stubbornness of their heart. This is, okay, so again, this is all about a group that was a member of the way that turned aside for an easier path, one that did not involve keeping the commandments of Elohim, as it says right here. Same thing keeps coming up over and over again. This is the word which Jeremiah spoke to Baruch, the son of Neriah, and Elisha, to Gehazi, his servant, all the men who entered the new covenant in the land of Damascus, but turned back and betrayed, turning aside from the fountain of living waters. Where do you hear this phrase? This is a favorite phrase of, of, of Christian theologians, talking about the fountain of living waters being Yeshua. Where it actually says, that, you know, he, living waters will, will flow from it. So these are men who entered the new covenant in the land of Damascus, but then turned away. Same theme that you see repeated all through this document. These are not non-believers. These are men who entered the new covenant and turned away will not be reckoned in the foundation of the people and in his book shall not be inscribed from the day of the gathering. So, manu manuscript A ends here. Like, well, it doesn't end, it's just the, the last part of it's missing. So now this is all for manuscript B. The day of the gathering of the teacher of the community into the standing up of the Messiah from Aaron and from Israel. And this is the judgment on any members of the assembly of men of perfect holiness who hesitates to do the commandments of the upright. So you again see, as this note says, there's this emphasis on doing, a very Jamesian type of, of uh, wording. He is the man who melted in the furnace, according to the appearance of his works, shall be expelled from the assembly, like someone whose lot had not had never fallen, had sorry, like someone whose lot had never fallen among the disciples of Elohim. So this person who's turning aside here, who hesitates to do the commandments of the upright. He is the man who is melted in the furnace. According to the appearance of his works, shall he be expelled from the assembly. So this man is expelled from the assembly by someone whose lot had never fallen among the disciples of Elohim. So this man, of course, is claiming to be among the disciples, which is another claim that you see from Paul that said he was a disciple. According to his rebelliousness, the man of knowledge shall punish him until the day he returns to stand in the presence of the men of perfect holiness, and, in his, and his works are revealed according to the letter of the interpretation of the Torah in which the, man, the men of perfect holiness walk. Uh, so this person is being brought before the men of perfect holiness. So if this is the Jerusalem assembly, then this man who's teaching against the Torah is going to be brought before the assembly. He's uh, claiming to be among the disciples of Elohim. Does that sound like anyone we know, or anyone who did that in, uh, in the New Testament? We're almost done with this. I think I'm going to go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and push on through. I don't think we have very much further to go. Nor shall anyone cooperate with him in riches, in, in purse, in work, uh, or mission. For all the holy ones of the Most High have cursed him. So when, when this man is expelled from the assembly, you don't um, cooperate with him in purse. So I guess it would be like you don't enter into any kind of financial dealings with him. Or mission. You don't 
continue the mission with him. Um, so you could think of, and I think it was Acts fifteen thirty eight. I believe this is referring to Barnabas withdrawing from Paul. Uh, so he no longer continued on the mission. For all the holy ones of the Most High have cursed him. And this is the judgment too, which will be upon all those who reject the Torah among or the, the first among the first, or the Torah of the first. And the last, so here you see his first and the last, the language in the Gospels, who have put idols in their heart and have walked in the stubbornness of their heart, they shall have no share in the house of the Torah. They shall be judged according to the judgment on their companions who turned aside with the men of scoffing because they spoke mistakenly about the laws of righteousness and rejected the covenant and the compact which they raised in the land of Damascus. And this is the new covenant. So the new covenant is this uh, compact that they made in the land of Damascus. So again, there's this group that's entered the covenant and then rejected it. And neither they nor their family shall have a share in the house of the Torah. And from the day of the gathering in of the guide, Yoreh, um, of the community until the end of all the men of war who walked with the man of lying approximately 40 years. And in that era, the wrath of Elohim will be kindled against Israel as it was said, there is no king, no prince, no judge, none to rebuke righteousness. But the penitents from sin in Jacob kept the covenant of Elohim. So the question is, is this Jacob Jacob the son of uh, Isaac or is this James because James name in Hebrew is Jacob it's not James the penitents from sin in James or Jacob kept the covenant of Elohim then each man shall speak to his neighbor each man strengthening his brother to support their steps in the way of Elohim and Elohim hearkened to their words and heard, and a book of remembrance was written before him for Elohim fearers and for those considering his name until Elohim shall reveal salvation, or Yesha, and justification to those fearing his name. Um, then you shall return and see the difference between the righteous and the wicked, between the servant of Elohim and he who does not serve him, between Kepha and the one teaching a different doctrine. For he does love mercy to thousands of them that love him and to his keepers for a thousand generations. But all the men of the house of Peleg, or the house of separation, who went out from his place of holiness and relied upon Elohim during the era of Israel's rebellion and pollution of the temple, but turned aside from Elohim among the people, and things that were for them of little importance, they shall be judged, each man according to his spirit, in his holy counsel, and with the appearance of the glory of Elohim to Israel, all among the members of the covenant, who transgressed the boundaries of the Torah, shall be cut off from the midst of the camp, and with them all the evil ones of Judah, in the days of his trials. However, all those who hold fast to these statutes coming and going in accordance with the Torah and listened to the voice of the teacher and confessed before Elohim we have sinned, we have been wicked, we and our fathers, because they walk contrary to the laws of the covenant. But your judgments upon us are truth. Nor will we lift up our hand against the holiness of his laws and the righteousness of his judgments and the testimonies of his truth. So this, this in itself sounds very similar to the prayer of Daniel. And he was uh, praying for Elohim to restore the, uh, the nation. Rather, we have been instructed in the statutes of the first in which the men of the community were judged. And they shall listen to the voice of the teacher of righteousness and not depart the laws of righteousness. But rather, when they hear them, they shall exult and rejoice and their hearts will be strengthened and they shall prevail against all the sons of the earth and Elohim will make atonement for them, and they will see his salvation, they will see his Yeshua, 
because I took refuge in his holy name. So that's the end of the Damascus document. There's plenty of, uh, of notes here. So, um, you know, I just wanted to read through this and go over some of these documents. I know I talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls a lot. It's always helpful for me uh, to review these. And usually when I get you know, here on camera and start talking about this stuff, more will be revealed to me. Um, so I don't know if this whole business about the covenant of the first, if it, if it means the first covenant or if it's speaking about the ancestors as Robert Eisman says, but notice that Robert Eisman, he's not a uh, believer in Yeshua, as far as I know. Um, but notice that he, he, he even sees this as them speaking about Yeshua. They will see his salvation because they took refuge in his holy name. So we go down here to note 51. One should note the triumphant exploitation of this ending almost exactly the same as in the Habakkuk Peshir. In addition to the uses, usage of seeing Yeshua with which it ends, one should also note that of being strengthened. The meaning of the curious nickname Oblius, or Oblius applied to James in the early Christian literature, strength or fortress of the people. Um, so this is something that uh, we have a quotation from Eusebius where he's quoting Hegesippus. And Hegesippus says that James had this nickname, Oblius, which means a bulwark or the strength of the fortress of the people. So um, I guess that's it for this document. I will be putting up also the community rule and the Habakkuk Pesher as time allows. So look for those if you enjoyed this and thanks for listening. Shalom.